Good morning. It is good to see each of you here this morning. As I know it's a cold, been a cold week. It's warmed up a little bit. We're thankful for that. And uh, um, when you look around what the rest of the country is experiencing with the snow and ice and so forth, we have a lot to be thankful for. We, we can deal with a little bit of cold weather. But I know you, the, the kids would like more snow days and stuff. But uh, the older I've got, the more I appreciate not having snow days. So. Uh, but it's good to see each, each of you here the, the, this morning. So uh, we have had several who have been out sick back with us this morning. Good to have you back. Uh, and we have some out sick this morning. Our prayers, as Charles mentioned, are, are with him this morning. And our visitors, you honor us by choosing to worship with us. And we hope that uh, the worship experience has been such that you'd want to be back with us at your very first opportunity. Encourage you to come back tonight. We have our second Sunday night congregational singing. It's always a good time for us to practice our new songs that we're learning and, and also to encourage our young men that are, that are coming up as our uh, future song leaders and present song leaders, really, many of them, uh, to also give them time to, 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 to work on, on uh, their song leading skills. So it's just a good time to get together and, and sing praises to God. Uh, this coming Wednesday night's Cook's Not Out. We're having a taco and nacho bar. and love to have everyone sign up. I'd like to be out for that. That way you don't have to write cooking. Cook in the middle of the week, just come on out and we'll have a meal prepared for you and uh, just a time of fellowship as well. We've been studying lessons from, from, the, the, uh, from John for a few weeks now. Uh, and this morning, uh, we're going to look in uh, chapter 6, uh, sort of a continuation of sort of where we left off maybe last week. But John tells us from, 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 from the gospel, the reason he wrote this gospel was in order that people might believe, and in believing in Jesus might have life in his name. So it's really important for us to understand his motivation, because everything that John says in his gospel is about bringing people to that point of decision, of accepting Jesus, believing who he is, and what scripture reveals about him. So this morning's lesson, we're going to sort of look from, from verses 22 through 29, and I sort of entitled the lesson, Living on Empty and Liking It. So I know that, that, that some of you are, are, are like myself. You like just to just to see how far you can go with that little light flashing. Okay? You, you, you want to know just how far you go. And I'm that way quite frequently except from when I'm traveling. You know, uh, We go to, to see Evan down in Montgomery. And, and when we get about halfway to Montgomery, there's a little place called Dodge City. I don't know what it, I don't know the exit. It's, it's the exit I think Charles and Laura may take to, to go visit her family. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's one at 199, I think it is. Exit 199, yeah, I'm getting an affirmation. To me, that, that's the point where I always want to fill up. We're about half a tank, but I want to fill it up. When I'm traveling, I wonder if I've got, no, I've got enough gas to get back home. That's all I want to know. Do I have enough to get the gas to get back? So I, I always fill up. We can make it on the, to Montgomery easy, but I always fill up there because I want to know I've got enough gas to get back home. And, and some of you probably have some pretty interesting running out of gas stories. You know, Ray, Ray's had more than one of those uh, to be able to coast right in and, and, and into a gas station on, 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 on fumes. And, uh, and, and we, Tammy, she sort of knows that, that, that when I travel, I do like to stop and get gas. We did have one bad experience. We went to South Carolina, South Carolina one time. Uh, and I said, there's a gas station. Oh, there's got to be more gas stations. And we almost ran out of gas. We got to fumes, basically, to get to, to, get to Clemson, South Carolina. Uh, there was very few places to get gas the route that we took that time. So, so it, it's, not, it's not fun to run out of gas. Okay? But, but there's some people who tend to, tend to sort of like that, you know, the, maybe the thrill of that. But this lesson's about not being gasoline, but about being empty of yourself and full of Christ. And being comfortable with that. That, that. that your salvation is not based upon what you can accomplish in this life. It, it, it's, it's not on what you can contribute to it. That you rest in Christ alone. That you can't earn it. You can't work it out. You, 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 can't, you can't sort of undo the bad stuff by doing a bunch of good stuff. It doesn't work that way. It's about putting your faith in Christ alone. That he truly becomes your bread of life. So we like sometimes that confidence that the full tank brings. You know, uh, you can get in your car and, and, and sometimes it's sort of a measure of how stressed people's lives are. And I sometimes ask people in counseling. And when you get in your car and you see how much gas in your tank, do you ever do the calculation how far you can get on that tank of gas without having to stop? People say, yeah. I said, you're really stressed then. If you're having those thoughts of fleeting and getting away from things and you're, they're really probably pretty stressed. 
You see, we, we like that confidence of knowing that we can do it, sometimes on our own. We like that. Spiritually speaking, Jesus wants us to have more faith than that. Jesus, Jesus wants us to trust in Him more and less in ourselves. That, that's really the essence of what this whole story is, that we're talking about that John says is that, that, that Jesus had just fed, if you remember the context, Jesus had fed 5, 000, over 5,000 people. That was men, not counting women and children. And it was quite an accomplishment from five loaves of bread and, and, and two fishes, if you will, five pieces of pita bread and two sardines. What an accomplishment. And not only that, but there was enough left over, 12 baskets left over for the 12 apostles, possibly, to let them know that when you serve God, that he will provide and sustain you. And then Jesus sending the apostles into the storm and, and then them going across the, the Sea of Galilee and hitting this contrary wind, as John says, and, and, and them being greatly afraid. And then Jesus walking on the water to them. And, and you remember Peter getting out and, and making it some distance before he took his eyes off, eyes off the Lord and began to sing. Now they're crossed the other side. And what's happened is the multitudes they were trying to get away from have followed them. You see, it was quite impressive having your belly filled. It was quite impressive is what this, this young rabbi was doing. The words he was saying was not like anyone else ever spoke. And the, some of the miracles he was doing was just phenomenal. You know, his credentials probably followed him. The different places he'd been, different things. He had done. But in chapter 26, verse 28, 29, they, then they said to him, that's the multitude, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered, said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he, whom he sent. I guess there were some people saying, man, if I could do that fishes, loaves and fishes thing, it would sure make going to the grocery store a whole lot less troublesome. If I could just take what you did and make a meal every day for my family, wow, that would... Wouldn't have to go to the marketplace very often. If I could do the things that you do, I want to do that kind of work. What way we do that we can do stuff like that? How we can do the work of God. And Jesus, here's what your job is. Is to believe in me. This is what God desires of you. That you believe in him whom he sent. That, that's what God's desire for you is. Basically, what the people would know is, you know, how can we keep our own tanks full? How can we be self-sufficient? How can we just be just me and God? And Jesus says, wait a minute. You're missing the point. God's desire for you is that you believe in him whom he sent. And that is me. They said, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. In other words, prove it. If this is God's desire that we believe, do some great work for us. Our fathers ate manna. And, 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 and it doesn't seem to be too far away from what Jesus had just done for them. He provided food in the middle of a desert for them. And, and he said he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus will say to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They wanted to believe. They, they wanted to have what Jesus was promising. It sounded really good that, that this God sent bread was really the thing that sustained them. To keep, it sounded really, really good to them. The problem was what God was asking them to do was to put their faith and trust in His Son. The challenge that, that, that God really was asking them is to accept Jesus because he is my son. They were sort of stuck on the physical needs. They, they were still having a hard time understanding that, that the manna and, and bread that Jesus was talking about wasn't about filling their physical bellies. Jesus tells them more or less that they need more than bread to live on. 
Remember when Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness and Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days and Satan says, see, here is stones. Turn them into bread that you may eat. And what does Jesus say? Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus is really trying to take them from the point of being physically empty to spiritually full. And when that happens, guess what? We've done what God's called us to do. Verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. You see, John has seven I am sayings. Remember, he wrote this in order that we might believe. He has seven I am statements in the book of John. He says, Jesus says on one occasion, he says, I'm the light. Then he says, I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection, the life. I'm the way, the truth, and life. And I'm the true vine. And now in this verse, he says, I am the bread from heaven. You see, it's not lost maybe on some people, especially in Jesus' hearing, if they knew his background. Uh, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, Bethlehem is simply a, it, it, it is an anglicized Hebrew word. Okay. Uh, from, from, from the two words that, that mean bait means house and leka means bread. Okay. And, if, and so really Jesus was born in the house of bread. Bait lechem, bait lechem, Bethlehem. You know, so we sort of anglicize it, Bethlehem, but Beit Lechem. So the bread of life comes from where? The house of bread. As prophesied by Micah, the prophet. And, and so the people, so the question, what shall we do that we may do the work of God is nothing. But believing in Him. You see, faith's been a difficult thing for people throughout all times. R remember the story of Naaman? The leper and how the young slave girl told, told the people of Naaman's house that, hey, there's a prophet in my home country that could cure him of his leprosy. So they so they actually packed up and and, and, and went to the prophet because the prophet wouldn't come to him. And, and, and the prophet more or less said, you know, just go dip seven times in the river Jordan. Didn't even come out himself, but send the servant out to tell him to dip seven times. And Naaman was incensed. He said, we have better rivers at home than that. He was angry. And then one of the servants says, but Father, referring to him in reverence, if he done you to, 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 to ask you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? You, you see, sometimes we, 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 want, we, we want we want the, the, the technicolor version of it. We, we want all the we want all the, 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 the pins and whistles. We, we want everything. And the most profound thing that you can do in this life is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is asking them to do. Empty yourselves of yourselves and put your faith and trust in me. Verse 39 through 40. This is the will of the Father who sent me, Jesus says, that all he has given me, I should, uh, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. What's God's will? Believe in Jesus Christ. What will he do? Jesus says, if you put your faith in me, I'm not going to lose you. I will lose nothing. In fact, in the last day, I will raise you up. I will become your ever-sustaining bread of life. I will, not, I will not lose you. The Hebrew writer says, he will not forget us, nor leave us. This is what the Father's will is. You cannot earn your salvation. The children of Israel and the wilderness could not feed themselves. They, they had to rely 
on God. That God alone was sufficient. You know, there's a lot of religions in this world that, that teach that you do meritorious type things and, and, and you'll be saved. In fact, there are certain Christian denominations that teach pretty much that. You do this, this, and this, and then you can earn your, your salvation or you can earn your place out of purgatory or you can earn these different things. In fact, just this week in Paris, there were a group of men who went in and shot people. Now, what the people were doing, essentially, they believed by serving Allah in this way that they can achieve a place in paradise. That, that their concept of God is that God's not big enough to fight his own fight, so we've got to go fight his fight for him. And so we do horrible things in his name in order to earn a great reward later on. You see, when you put the effort on men's ability to do it, you get to a very scary place, a very dark place, in fact. What Jesus is telling these people is that you have to trust in me because that's what the children of Israel are supposed to be learning in the wilderness. God led them out of slavery, but led them through the wilderness and sustained them and kept them because they could not do it on their own efforts. They had to rely on on God. These things begin turning pretty quickly in these verses. In verse 41, then the Jews complained about him said, because, I, he, because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. You see, if he, if he said, that, here's, here's the trick, guys. Here's the magic words. Here's the magic way of learning this. Here's steps one, two, three on how to make you know, multiple loaves of bread and, and a lot of fishes out of nothing. They would have bought that. But for him to suggest that he was the bread sent down from heaven and they must believe in him, they begin to complain. You know, we like our own tanks filled. We want to be self-sufficient. I believe that that one of the things that's easier sometimes for young people to bear the gospel is because they don't have the pride of self-sufficiency. I think sometimes when a, when, a, when a young person responds to the gospel has been raised and taught the gospel, they don't have that capacity that, well, you know, I'm the captain of my own fate. I'm in charge of me. They're still young enough and tender enough to realize that I need someone else. And so maybe that's what the gospel is for them. But, but sometimes I see people later who put it off in life and, and they, they just seem to be almost so full of pride. Or stubbornness. Or self-will. For them to admit. I can't do it on my own. I must rely upon Christ. I'm not self-sufficient. Faith demands otherwise. Faith says that you know. You, you are not your own God. You're not the own captain of your faith. You cannot save yourself. You know, if Greg, you still got your appendix. So got your, you still have your appendix. Okay, so okay. But let's say Greg goes home this time and he begins having this sharp pain in his abdomen. You know, it's a man that that hurts. That really, really hurts. You know, and 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 it, it's tender. You know, and so he gets he gets on the internet and says, you know, symptoms of appendicitis, and he looks up. And he says, I have every one of those. You know. And, and, and he says to Sheila, you know, Sheila, I think I have an appendicitis. And she says, well, Greg, let's go to the hospital. And he says, no, I think I can do this. Go get a sharp knife. I think I've got this. Okay. We would all pretty much agree with Sheila that he's lost his mind. <laughs> you know, he's got to go to the hospital. You know, he's got to do it. Okay. We, we, we would just not comprehend someone saying, I think I've got this. I can do my own appendectomy. I've got the app for that. Why do spirits of people want to do the same? Why must they count on their own selves and, and not on God's grace and His mercy, but on what they can accomplish and do to earn or merit their salvation? And faith demands otherwise. Another thing about Jesus being manna-like 
Because that's God sent the manna from heaven, but you know what? It, it had a lot of similarities to Christ. It, it was pure white, and Jesus is pure, came down from heaven, pure from, from sin. And, and it was sustaining to them. But they had a choice. God sent the manna. Every day they walked up, they walked out their tent. They had a choice whether to pick it up and eat or to walk on it. They could reject it or pick it up. Like the man, and they did later say, we're getting tired of this manna. But God provided it, but they had a choice. They didn't have to eat it, but they had a choice. You know, people today have a choice as well. Now, if the people ate the manna, they lived. If they didn't eat the manna, guess what? They died. So we're sort of faced today, even as Christians, you know, is Christ alone sufficient or do we need another guarantee? Do, do, do we have to have faith plus works? First John chapter, I mean, John chapter six, 48 through 50. Jesus, says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Jesus is saying, I, I'm the true bread. That they ate a they ate a substance back there that, that you know that didn't keep them alive forever, but I will keep you alive forever. I will be the one who will defeat death. I will be the one that will raise you in the last day. In order to fulfill God's grace, be full of God's grace, we need to sustain ourselves and our lives on the bread of life. We must put our faith and trust. In Jesus. In Bible study class this morning, read from Hebrews chapter 4, where the Hebrew writer says, Let us hold fast that confession. We talked a bit about what is that confession we're holding fast to. The confession is the confession we ask all penitent believers to make. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He died for my sins. Hebrew writer says, don't, don't turn loose of that. Don't, don't, don't give that up. Because that allows us to be full of God's grace and His mercy. Verse 51 of the chapter, Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus goes on to even foreshadow His death on the cross. He said, this, this is what's going to happen. He says, if you eat the, this bread, you will live forever. And this bread is my flesh. When Jesus will later implement the Lord's Supper, he will take the bread and says, this is my flesh, my body, which is given for you. He will take the cup and says, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for mission of your sins. And so we understand that Jesus is foreshadowing this and they didn't like it. They didn't like this about him offering his flesh and, and, and about they had to partake of him. They, they didn't like the idea of putting their faith and trust in Christ alone. We live in a world today that, like the Jews, reject the, reject the truth about Jesus. You know, if you listen to the world, there's all different kind of ways to God. You can practice this religion and that religion. They, they'll all argue, oh, they're all a way to God. You can do some, some new age, mother nature, tree hugging thing if you want to. It's a way to God. What does Jesus say? John chapter 14. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes a father except by me. You see, for him to suggest what he was suggesting to these people who believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who believed in Moses, who put their faith and trust in that story, that believed truly that, that, that God was going to redeem this world as a nation through this king that, that was going to be like David. And this young rabbi upstart was not what they were looking for. He did not seem like a path to God to them. But yet he had the audacity to tell them that he alone is the way to God. When we recognize our own limitations, our own inability to save ourselves from our own efforts, we learn to trust in Christ and truly be filled with the grace 
of God. Sometimes we sing a refrain in a song. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross. I cling. When we begin to understand that and, and, really, and, and, and really begin to trust in God's grace and His mercy, we realize that, that Christ alone is sufficient. We recognize when we don't have to fill our own tanks, but letting God's grace fill our tanks for us, we learn that Christ alone is all we need. Verse 53 through 54, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. This is just crazy talk to them. What? What are you suggesting? Some perverted form of cannibal? What are you suggesting here? This, this, this sounds like heresy to them. Now, to us, we sort of understand because we get to look back on it. But to them, this is crazy talk. Now, where are you going with this? That your body's going to sustain us? That, that, that somehow that, that you're going to have this magical transformation thing that, that, that you're by eating your flesh and drinking your blood, you have eternal life and you're raised in the last day? Now, we have the luxury of looking back because we live in the time we lived in. But what they heard was quite difficult for them to embrace and understand. And God knows it's hard for mankind to want to trust his own effort, not to want to trust his own efforts to save him. In fact, Jesus says in verse 61, his disciples begin complaining about what he's saying. He says, does this offend you? Does this offend you? Jesus will go on to say in verse 63, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to your spirit, and they are life. Jesus says, you're going to have to understand what matters in this life is not a full belly. It's not in the, your own ability to make miracles happen. But it's in your relationship to Jesus Christ. The problem with filling our own tank is that we cannot keep it full. Only the Spirit can do that. In 66 to 67, John tells us, From that time, many disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Each one of us here this morning, for the most part, represents a small percentage of the people that you know, that you go to school with, that you work with, that, that, that are out in the community. You rep represent a small percentage of the people that you know who have full faith in Jesus Christ and be sufficient for all that they need. To be their sustainer, to be their savior, to be their hope and the Redeemer. You've reached that point where you say, well, like Peter said, you know, Lord, who else do we have to go to? Because you have the words of life. You know, Jesus will never force himself upon you. In fact, in, earlier in John, it said the people wanted to force and make him king by force. That's one reason Jesus went away to the other side because he would not be by, made king by force. You have to choose. It, it, it is your choice. Jesus, Peter, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, whom whom shall we give? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does it mean to allow Jesus to be the bread of your life? It means that you make this confession. It means that you live this confession. That, that upon doing this, that, that, that you enact your life in the body of Christ, as, as, as we've said before, at church, what is the gospel? 
You know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says. That's the essence of the gospel. So what happens when we make this confession that we reenact the gospel in our life through baptism, our death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that puts us in this relationship with the Father and the Son. As I was preparing for the lesson, you know, I just imagined what had happened maybe in, in hours earlier that, that they were out on the Sea of Galilee and the storm had come up and Jesus walked to him on the water and Peter got out of the boat and, and almost drowned. He took his eyes off the Lord. And imagine them sitting there and Peter maybe still damp, his clothes still damp from, from his experience in the sea. And, and Peter making this great statement. You have the words of life. And we've kind of believed that you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter knew full well what it meant to put your faith and trust in the Lord. What Jesus was asking them to do here was accept Him as being God's Son. And that He was truly the only way to God. John 6, verse 54, Jesus again refers to whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood as eternal life. And I'll raise Him up. At the last day. So we. Every week. We as New Testament Christians. Do this. I don't know why religious groups refuse to do it. I, I don't understand what, what, what the problem with it is. But, but many religious groups. They don't observe. The weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. But I, I think that, that God implemented it. Instituted it for us to understand from what Jesus was saying here in John, that, that something was going to transpire in our experience, that He alone was going to be sustaining. And then He chose to give us this meal, this symbolic meal, as a reminder of our dependency on Him. And our sole reliance on Jesus as our Savior. And you cannot buy this meal. Contrary to what the kids said, that the parents were taking the Lord's Supper, then the offering plate went around after the Lord's Supper, and the kid says, how much did that cost you? See, that, 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 that's a misconception. And I understand what James' brother Jesus was talking about when his concern was that some people had reached the point that they saw that meritorious works that were no benefit. He said, no, faith without works is dead, being alone. We do good things because we are saved, not to be saved. It's consistent with what James and Paul both are, are bringing the points are out. But we have many good cooks here at Nettleton, and, and, and I bear the evidence of that from our dinners and, and get-togethers. But, but can you imagine maybe inviting someone's house for dinner? You know, I, I, I know uh, many people here host their families, Gail and Linda, take take time about hosting their families and uh can you imagine going to to someone's home for dinner and and it was really a good dinner okay you're invited to go there and they prepared a good dinner for you and you said well that that was just a really good dinner what do i owe you and they said well you're you're a guest in my home you don't owe me. no 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 i insist and they take out a wallet and start throwing money on the table would you <laughs> linda says okay i'll do that <laughs> But, but for the most part, we would consider that a social insult. That, that you're insulting me by thinking you can repay my kindness. I wonder how God feels sometimes when we don't put our faith and trust in Christ alone. We think sometimes if I can just get just perfect enough or good enough or, or make enough amends for enough bad things, that, that somehow I will earn what God is offering to give me freely. You know, I think as Christians, we need to put our full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That He is the bread of our life. He is our sustainer. And He alone has done it all. Not of our own works, as Paul says regarding grace, that any of us should boast. But by the own gift, freely given, in order that we might be saved. If there's anyone here today who's never made that confession... Except that Jesus is your Savior. Don't let pride, stubbornness, your own weakness or, or past experiences prevent you this morning 
from making the most important statement you'll ever make in your life, that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He died for your sins. And we'll celebrate that with existing in a new birth. Or there's anyone here this morning in need prayer on your behalf. Won't you come as we stand and sing the song that's been selected?